The following program was recorded at Works Annual Conference in Orlando, Florida. I'm pleased to welcome Supply Chain Brain Editor Emeritus, Jean Murphy. Hello. Today I'm speaking with Barry Brandman, President of Danby Investigations. We're going to be talking about best practices in supply chain security. Welcome. Thank you. As a company that audits domestic and international supply chain security programs, tell me what are some of the biggest mistakes that companies make when they try to protect their assets? One of the most common mistakes that we find is that companies oftentimes have a higher opinion of how effective their supply chain safeguards are than the way that they work in reality. And uh, that uh, leads to a sense of complacency. And uh, we think that it's extremely important when we uh, are contracted to do risk assessments for companies is that we go beneath the surface, we test their systems, we uh, want to m make sure that they're very meaningful and are still effective and uh, can counteract any of the most uh, recent threats that companies face today out there. So uh, I think that uh, being under a, a false sense of security oftentimes leads to complacency and that usually precedes a major supply chain security, uh, security breach. So I, I would view that as one of the biggest dangers that companies need to be aware of. And when we're talking about supply chain security, is it mostly the physical goods um, or the, the risk of theft, that kind of thing, or, or is it also information security that's at issue? Information security is one of those areas that needs to be looked at. Uh, when you look at security today, it's really a multifaceted problem. You're looking about uh, uh, issues involving theft from distribution centers, uh, cargo theft while it's in transit. You're looking at sabotage, product tampering, as well as the introduction of uh, unmanifested materials or weapons that can be uh, placed inside conveyances in the supply chain that come into the United States and result in an act of terrorism. So what are some of the best practices that companies should encompass in a security program? Uh, there's actually an array of best practices and of course uh, far too many to cover just in one interview, but just to look at a couple, I, I think that the first thing to do is a company needs to, as I said before, reassess how effective their supply chain security safeguards really are and determine the difference between a cosmetic or superficial level of protection and meaningful security. Uh, once you flush out the difference, then identify those areas that need to be strengthened. But understand that this is not a one-time process. Security risks change over time. There's different threats, different parameters, different logistics that need to be taken into account. And security is not a static issue. So once you do it, you need to understand that it's necessary to reassess your security program uh, every three to four years. Once you identify those weaknesses and you take remedial action, I think it's, in, it's extremely important that companies audit their programs. As uh, President Reagan once said, trust but verify, and the same concept holds true in the private sector. If a company is not going to conduct some type of external, overt, or uh, confidential audit, they're really not going to know whether their program is operating the way it's designed to do so and you need to flush out the reality. How does a company operate on a day-to-day -day basis? Only by identifying those areas of weakness or non-compliance will a company be able to effectively remedy those problems and ensure that there are no glaring weaknesses for others to exploit, whether it be insiders for theft purposes or outsiders that want to smuggle in weapons of mass destruction into a, uh, an international supply chain. In terms of terrorism, the government has, of course, imposed a number of programs. Um, I wonder overall how you think the government has done in terms of its response, and particularly how you think the CTPAT program is working. I think the CTPAT program has been extremely successful. If you were to make a baseball analogy and look at a, a ball player that uh, got on base um, four or five out of every ten at bats, he would be a perpetual all-star and probably find a place in the Hall of Fame. 
for Customs and Border Protection CT PAT program of 400 to 500 batting average is an indication of failure. The, uh, the public holds them to a much more difficult standard, and that is perfection. They need to be absolutely certain that they don't make any mistakes or have any major vulnerabilities in the international supply chain. Otherwise, a weapon of mass destruction, whether it be conventional, biological, chemical, or nuclear, can be detonated on American soil. When you take into account that we import over 20 million conveyances a year into the United States through over 300 ports of entry, and we have not sustained another act of terrorism through the commercial supply chain, I think that they've done a remarkably good job. And keep in mind that the CTPAT program is an undertaking that is composed of a partnership between the federal government and the trade community. Both have worked very hard and contributed very dramatically to make the international supply chain far more safer, not just for the corporations themselves, but for the American public. So I think in terms of scoring the performance of CTPAT, I think it's one of the primary reasons that our country has been very fortunate and been able to avoid another act of terrorism on American soil. Going back to cargo theft for a moment, which continues to be a multi-billion dollar program, problem, uh, is undercover work a good way to um, fight against that? Undercover has always been a popular option for companies in the supply chain. Uh, the reason being is that uh, it's very flexible. You can run an undercover investigation in any aspect of the supply chain, whether it be while product is in transit, while it's being manufactured, consolidated, forwarded. And the undercover information itself not just sheds tremendous intelligence on individual theft, collusion, fraud, but it also will uncover problems such as workplace substance abuse, uh, individuals intent on tampering with the goods, sabotage, uh, operational intelligence such as poor supervision, neglect or non-adherence to company policies and procedures. These are the type of issues that can impact very negatively a company's bottom line and expose them for significant loss. Uh, undercover has been uh, very successfully used in that regard if it's run properly. And um, unlike what you see in the movies, undercover takes time and patience. The operative needs to make sure that they blend in that their cover is well established, that they gain the trust of those that they work with. Once that period has, has gone by and you move into the advanced phase of an investigation, more often than not, companies in the supply chain have seen a huge return on investment from these undercover operations, and that's why they continue to be used so frequently. It must be pretty expensive, though. What typically motivates uh, a company to go that route? Well, expense is a relative term. Undercover certainly is not cheap by any means, but if a company is sustaining a hundred or hundred and fifty thousand dollars in uh, annual inventory shortages and an undercover investigator can identify the source of that leakage, then undercover is well worth the money. If a company is uh, subject to product tampering, now you're talking about an issue that can not only impact the company's bottom line, because of inventory loss and lack of sales, but the uh, resulting uh, damage that would require uh, legal expense, public relations and media experts to come into the picture to mitigate the uh, fallout, uh, your, your costs can easily run into seven figures. If an undercover investigation can uh, expose those individuals that are intent on tampering with the product, and or find ways to better protect it and prevent it from happening proactively, then I think that companies will find undercover to be well worth the investment. And again, that's one of the reasons that undercover is so widely used. If you're having a problem with uh, very insignificant losses, uh, if your uh, supply chain is very, very secure as it is, if you're uh, not concerned um, about uh, sustaining major problems in the future, then undercover may not be uh, the right option for you, but um, those companies that do it, uh, and I think the, uh, the, the proof of the matter is that those companies that do utilize undercover investigations tend to run them far longer than they ever intended to do when they initiated the investigation. It's not unusual for our clients to keep the same operatives in their companies for five, eight, and even ten years. We've had some investigators that 
our clients have told us have provided such valued intelligence that they've actually retired with the same client after 20 years. The only people that knew that they were working undercover were senior executives in those companies. Very interesting. So um, overall, can you summarize the benefits for a company of having an excellent supply chain security program? When you're talking about the international supply chain today, you're talking about speed, reliability, and cost containment. And a world-class security program really addresses all three of those issues. If a company, for example, was to have uh, uh, their uh, supply chain, say hypothetically from Mexico to the U.S., intercepted, and uh, criminals south of the border were to smuggle some type of a contraband, a weapon, or narcotics, and their product was stopped at the U.S. side of the border, the interruption of their product and their inability to subsequently not just get that shipment, but future shipments to their customers in a timely, cost-effective manner will dram be dramatically affected going forward. If they're a member, for example, of the CTPAT program, or FAST, which allows their trucks to cross the border in a fraction of the time as non-FAST members, they will find that their importation costs will increase dramatically almost to the point where it takes away their ability to stay competitive in this marketplace. So I would say if a company is concerned about those factors, speed, reliability, and cost containment, then they can't afford not to have a world-class security program. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks. I've been speaking with Barry Brandman of Danby Investigations. Thank you for watching.